Good evening. Got your Bibles. Let's go to Luke chapter 16. Very familiar place. I've read this and preached from this several times, and I'm not able to exhaust it, I promise you. Luke's writings, the main two chapters I have probably never exhausted is Luke 15, 11 through 32, the parable of the prodigal son. And then this portion, I don't call it a parable, I call it a narrative of a rich man and, the, and Lazarus. I believe it's a narrative, I believe it was based on a real incident that really happened. It really was a rich man, and it really was a beggar. person. I believe there really was a lot of the people in the parables, such as the... I do believe there really was a, 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 a prodigal. But that's neither here nor there. I believe there's more. this is more of a narrative. Luke chapter 16, 19-31. Let's begin reading verse 19. And there was a certain... Rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. And see if a Lazarus all afar off. See you Abraham far off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus. They may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormenting this flame. And La but Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is tor comforted, and thou art torment. Beside us, there is us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither one can pass to us, and would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, thou, that thou would ascend him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may he testify unto them, as they come into this place of torment. Pardon me, I flipped the extra chapter. Abraham saith unto him, They have at Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. He said, Nay, Father Abraham, if one went unto them from the dead, they, shall, uh, they will repent. He said unto them, They hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they he be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Father, for this night. I thank you, Father, for this time I could preach your word. I ask you to anoint my lips of clay, anoint those who hear me. In Jesus' name, amen. The story of two beggars. Years ago, there was a man by the name of Horatio Alger, Jr., born January 13th, 1832, died July 18th, 1899. He was a writer. He was best known for his young, many young adult novels about impoverished boys and their rise from humble, from humble background to lives of middle-class security and comfort through hard work and determination, courage, and honesty. His writings were characterized by rags to riches narrative, which had formative effect on America during the Gilded Age. You know, 
There was a time I believe you could really have left a, a poor boy from a farm, from a poverty-stricken place, and could have rose up. I know it's a lot harder now. I'm not saying it can't happen, but I don't think it's as likely to. But I'll never say it can't happen. But you know, as much as there's a lot of light rags or riches, how many Hollywood performers came from from uh from uh bad backgrounds and worked their way up? But yet many of them after years of getting to the top have wound up at the bottom again. <clears throat> Begging. Dealing with two beggars here tonight. First one, he begged in this life. The second one, he begged in the afterlife. The one is a rag to riches story. The other one is riches to an absolute desolation story. I'm telling you tonight... <clears throat> I had rather be a rags to riches than from riches to absolute desolation. That's what we find here tonight. Two beggars. One in this life and the next in the next life. Amen. First off, I want to deal with a beggar in this life named Lazarus. Luke 16, 16, 20, and 30. Uh, 16, 20, and 21, and there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was full, laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. He was a very, very poor man. I personally believe, and I could be wrong, I kind of lean he couldn't have worked. He may have very well been crippled because it says he laid at his gates. He probably had to have help daily to do that. He was a beggar, a very poor man, a man that didn't have much. I almost picture him a man with just rags for clothes. I believe today, I believe there are people in that pathetic condition now. You know, here in America, we can find more help than probably any other nation. But if you go overseas, you'll see a lot of pathetic sights of poverty. Yes, here in America, too. And I'm going to make a prediction. If we don't have revival soon in America, and the Lord tarries much longer, we'll see more beggars just like Lazarus. He was a very poor man. <laughs> He was laid at the rich man's gate. He could have easily have walked, but I don't know. That expression implies someone had to put him there. I believe Lazarus was a man who was probably crippled or paralyzed. He was full of sores. I kind of believe if he was a leper, he would not have been laid at that gate. He would have probably been put. He would probably have been put uh, in a leper colony. I think I don't know what type of sores he really had, whether they were bed sores or whatever type of sores. His body was full of sores. He was a very sickly man, a man of bad health. You know, it's sad how many people have worked hard for years and have wound up in bad, as bad as shape, if not worse than Lazarus, full of sores and sickly and not able to work. And here they are crippled. And some of them one time did work hard. Perhaps they didn't do anything at all, just hard, work hard and just their body broke down for some reason. Or it could be because they worked so hard their body did break down. You know, people often will spend years wrecking their health to get their wealth. And then whenever they uh, get their health, I mean their wealth, then they spend the rest of their life wrecking their wealth to get their health back. It happens so much. 
Men working so long, hard hours, and finally their health is broken. Then what do they do? They take the wealth they've accumulated and spend the rest of their lives trying to go to doctor to doctor, trying to find help. It happens! I believe there's many men and many women who've wrecked their hills in this life trying to get some wealth. I tell you, it says he was full of sores. Maybe it was bed sores. I don't know what type. But I do know he was in bad shape. He desired to be fed with crumbs from the rich man's table. I told recently another message how some believe these crumbs were what, what people wiped their hands on and like napkins. You know, it's sad sometimes how destitute people get in this life. You know, so bad off they can't even get to a, to a soup kitchen and get a decent meal. They have to depend on crumbs, which really were fit only for the dogs. In fact, I believe that's one reason why the dogs kept coming by him and kept coming by him. Because the next thing he says, and the dogs came and licked his sores. I believe he was lived at the mercy of the dogs. I know there's some different schools of thought on what it was about. Some felt he was terrorized by dogs. Others feel that was the only source of comfort he had from his sores. I'm not saying yay or nay. It is very possible. But regardless, his life was a life which, you know, would not be called a success story. However, there are some things we can say about him that's good. He knew God. His name means assist from God or God's my help. I believe he knew God. He didn't go to an uptown synagogue. Perhaps he... Uh, when he could go to church, may he went to one of those poor holy roller churches on the wrong side of the tracks in that town when he was able to. I don't picture him going to any high class church. They probably would not even want want uh, want him in the high class church. That holy roller church probably took him the best they could with the minimal amount of money they had. You know, if you know God tonight. Regardless whether you're a rich man, a poor man, or a beggar. You know what? You can, you can have peace. You know, I believe in spite of his personal surroundings. I believe he was more, I believe his life was better than that of the other man. Oh, how can you say it? Because I believe he had peace in his heart. And even though Lazarus begged, I believe there was another way he begged during, during those days. Because he knew God. He probably saw that rich man come home from some business deals. Miserable. And Lazarus turned to him and said, Sir, I know I don't have much to offer you. But I know God who could help you. Maybe that's why he just kept feeding him the crumbs. Because his heart wasn't right with God. He had probably to keep up his social class. But he didn't want to. Uh, because if he had kicked him out. People would probably run him off from the synagogue. But because he kept feeding them. They thought well he is a good man. But in reality he was just probably. Put, probably just. Uh, tolerating him. The rich man in this life was a success story by most people's standards. He was rich. He clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. I believe he had a lot of material goods. I believe he had a nice home. Who knows, he may have had maids and servants. Uh, I don't know if he had a farm or not, but I believe he was a very well-to-do man. And people probably looked up to him in that day and age. Only to find out what the Bible really says. What the Bible says. 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 9. 
But they that will be rich fall into temptation and snare, unto many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Though he probably had a lot of money, he was not the most happy person. He fell into temptation. His life was a snare. And he fell into many hurtful and foolish lusts. He had clothes of fine linen and purple. Nicest clothes. He had food. He fared sumptuously every day. I believe he whined and dined. Who knows? He probably had manservants and maidservants who worked for him. And he probably paid them pretty good. Maybe not riches, but enough to survive on. Probably a lot better than Lazarus. I believe. He had the best of everything in his life. But he was missing. Because though he had the best of everything in this life, he didn't have the best he could have in life. The best you can have in life is knowing Jesus as your Savior. Having your sins forgiven and under the blood. And following him. Personally, I believe he was really right with God. He would have done more to help that poor beggar. I believe he would have done what he could to have helped him. But because he was such an evil man, he decided just to feed him the crumbs. But he had an appointment that we all have. And we all will face barring the second coming of Christ. comes the day according to Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 and it is appointed unto men once to die after this to judgment David before he died said I go the way of all the earth second verse Kings 2 2 I believe that came that day when he had that appointment. I don't know how young he was. I don't know how old he was. But that appointment came what does it say? And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by angels in Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. I like that. I heard a sermon years ago. Carried or buried. A young man, Brother Chad Everett, preached it, in fact. You know what happened? That, that poor man was carried by the angels. But the rich man was buried. I'm sure that that rich man had a lavish funeral. Probably diplomats from all over the kingdom, maybe even other countries came by and paid him honor. Probably the high priest of the synagogue of that day and age got up and spent time boasting on him, saying he was a good man. He gave the charity. He helped the poor. He gave plenty to our synagogues. He done what he could to help his fellow man. I believe he was married. I believe his wife about that time was tempted to do what one lady I heard did when the preacher got and started telling how great her husband was. She got up in the middle of the funeral, walked up to the casket and looked in and the preacher said ma'am well, why are you looking in the casket she said I want to make sure that that's the same man you were talking about I believe that this man probably if he had a wife he she probably was kind of curious who knows the way he whined and dined he may have even had a few girlfriends along the side we don't know but I believe this I believe he probably had the best of everything. And when he died, he probably had one of the most glorious funerals in that country. But you know what happened? That beggar was carried. He went to Abraham's bosom. Now, I believe Abraham's bosom is what was called paradise. Luke 23, 43. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I send to thee, they shall be with me in paradise. 
I know there's different schools of thought about the difference between heaven and paradise. I believe there is a difference. Paradise or Abraham's bosom was where the Old Testaments went when they died. It was in the underworld. But when Jesus rose from the dead, Abraham's bosom was opened up and all the saints in there went on into heaven to be with Jesus. On the other hand, I believe that poor... I believe, you know, people ask what happened to uh, to uh, Abraham's bosom. Now it's been closed. I'll tell you exactly what happened. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 19. Verse 14, pardon me. And hell hath enlarged herself. I believe that's where people, I believe now it's been taken over by hell. And I believe there's many people there now just like the rich man i believe that that poor beggar is going to be in the first resurrection blessed and holy is he that hath his part in the first resurrection on such a second death hath no power but they shall be priests of god and of christ and shall reign with him a thousand years i believe he is I believe he is that is waiting now for that day when the saints are caught up. He's waiting now for that that first resurrection. Gets a new body. His old body was pain racked. His old body had a lot of infirmities, but now when he gets his new body, he'll be his skin will be that of a babe. He will not have any marks on him. I believe everything will be different about him. He's now friends with the saints of old. Because the Bible says in Luke chapter 16, verse 23, And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and see if Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. I believe... Lazarus got to know many of the Old Testament saints. He probably shook hands and ate with King David, with Abraham. He probably sat and talked over things with Jacob and Israel and some of the many other Old Testament saints. He probably got to hear the exploitations of Daniel. You know what? And now he's in heaven with the saints of the New Testament era in addition. Peter, Paul, James, John, Luke, Mark, Bartholomew. I believe he knows them all. Paul, he's probably on a first name basis with each and every one of them. I believe he knows such great saints of old as John Wesley and Charles Finney. I believe he's got to know many of those saints. Who knows, he may have shook hands with my wife, Cindy. My wife, Sharon. I don't know. It doesn't matter to me. Just knowing that they're there is good enough. Amen. He's friends now with the great saints. He is now comforted. But Abraham said, Son, remember thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus. His evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. He's no longer sick in body. He wasn't even then. I believe he now, even at this time, he was comforted. And now he's in the presence of God. He's now in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe he's there. Shouting with the saints. Just waiting for his new body. About the rich man, he was buried. Like I said, he probably had a great funeral. And while they were preaching him into the highest heaven, he's down there screaming, begging in the lowest hell. I wonder how many times a preacher's been preaching somebody into heaven because they were a good moral person. Because maybe they gave to the poor. Maybe because they were philanthropists. They got up and preached them into heaven. When in reality they're in hell. 
I tell you what frightens me sometimes. I can name you several people whose funerals I definitely never want to go to because I don't want to hear the lie that they made heaven. Because see, I'm aware of a real place called hell. And I'm aware of what this book says about who's going to enter in the hell. A lot of people, even some professed Christians, are going to split hell wide open when they die. I don't want to be one of them. I want to make sure at all times he's now in hell. He sees in hell. He suffers pain, being in torments. And he's now begging in hell. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus. They may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. He thirsts, but he can't even get one drop of water because of the great gulf fixed between them. He remembers. He thirsts. He remembers those things as I brought out in the message not long ago. And now the great gulf is fixed between them. Luke 16, 26. And beside all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Oh, he was begging for water and could not get it. He now next begs for his five brethren. He begs Abraham to send his send the Lazarus to his five brethren. He did not want his five brethren to go to hell. I'm going to say something. If you got a brother or sister, now's the time to be praying for them. Now's the time to be reaching them. Now's the time to do what you can for the souls of men. I know there's situations where you're not going to be able to reach them. Maybe you've tried and they've just outright rejected you. I understand that fully. Maybe you've tried, but like I said, they don't want anything to do with you now. Amen. And sometimes just for wisdom's sake, it's better to not go around them anymore. But I'll tell you what, I believe tonight, I believe that if you really love God, you will not want to see your, your brethren in hell. Even if all you can do is just pray and trust God 100%. That's all you can do sometimes. I would never tell you to go into an abusive situation. I fully understand that. Amen. Amen. They cared for his brothers. I wonder how else in this lifetime he uh, was mad at his brothers. Probably could even care could care less about them. Probably even wish that they would gone ahead and died lost. But now that he's in hell, he doesn't desire it at all. I'll tell you something. He's there now. Till the day of the white throne judgment. He'll be judged in that day. But I don't believe he's going to be eager to get out. Because I believe it's going to be the most miserable time of his life. I'm going to tell you. I believe when the judgment's over. During the judgment. They're going to wish they would just go ahead. And cast them into the lake of fire. But they'll have to face every sin they have ever committed, and then they're cast to the lake of fire. Now, should we not want any of our brethren in hell? We should desire not to go there ourselves. How can I avoid hell? It's simple. By faith. Recognize that you're a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned. You've come short of the glory of God. That includes every one of us. <clears throat> There's none of us here who could say that their works has made them ready. None of us. It's only the blood of Jesus. 
and repent of your sin that's have godly sorrow and by faith receive him he will change you yes he will there's a real place called hell I want to challenge you please don't go there Lazarus was a poor, miserable man in this life, but now he's a success story. The rich man was probably a very well-to-do success story in this life, but now he's in hell. Where do you want to be tonight if you don't know Jesus? Now's the time to receive him. Why not repent and by faith receive the risen Savior today? God bless you.